Well, hi everyone, and welcome back to Pushing the Limits. Today, I have a superstar of a guest that I'm really, really excited about speaking to because this is a very learned gentleman and an elite athlete and someone who is I greatly admire. I have Professor Grant Schofield to guess. Welcome to the show. Love hi, Lisa. Have you, Grant. Yeah, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I've been following you from a distance from years and you know just enjoying your achievements loving it so great to get on the show and likewise in reverse so thank you very much it's a it's a real honor um so today we i reckon we're just gonna dive into some of the stuff that you've been re researching and what's on your mind at the moment because you've got so many areas that i could go down you know looking at you know high fat diets and yeah. uh, obesity and diabetes and prevention then we could look at the the, um, the white paper that you just recently released which I've I just studied and went wow that was all about glutamate and <laughs> toxicity and I'm like well that's new that was all new to me so which direction and and firstly give us a bit of an introduction to you and your background and your sporting career and all of that sort of stuff uh, yeah so like I'd always something that always interests me in my life is uh, things that I was sort of good at and I was only good at them because I liked doing them was uh, not so much school, but science and biology. Like I just like that. I don't know. I just like, like learning about that stuff. And I, that was right from the very start of school. And I, this is just something that continued to happen. And then I also like doing sports. Uh, and I was just like one of those kids who was into their sports and I was okay at, what I did, you know, like every New Zealand kid plays rugby. I wasn't that great, but I played it. You know, I got in the first 15 rugby and all this sort of stuff and that sort of thing. And and the school I was at also did rowing as a sport, which, yeah, you know, and they did it at a performance level. So it was to win the national championships. And they, so the, the crews I was in trained hard and uh, there was, you know, there was high performance aspects to, you know, as wrong as they were in hindsight of nutrition and psychology and, you know, training and, uh, you know, the, the, the broad range of things that good, teenage athletes get involved with and of course that all finishes when you finish a school and I, I sort of found myself well, I'll go to uni uh, my dad was an engineer and he thought I should go to I, I wanted to go to do physical education uh, that was the main thing I was interested in and my family sort of poo-pooed me out of it and told me I should go and do engineering and I, I lasted a week in there <laughs> uh, it obviously wasn't for me yep so I ended up in in a degree studying physiology and psychology just a, a science degree because that's what I found interesting and then I went from you know not really being that interested to all of a sudden getting these A pluses I didn't think I was wow. that brainy but it was just you know I was just used to go to lectures and not really take notes and just listen and ask questions and it was really interesting mm -hmm. um, and then but because I wasn't that mature there was never a point in my life early on where I was like you know Grant Schofield is now capable of getting a decent job where someone's going to employ him and he's going to make some difference to the world that wasn't a thing right yeah so so you know I couldn't finish this one degree and go and get a job because I wasn't capable of doing any work I didn't <laughs> think like that at the time but that's the reality in hindsight right so um and, and of course this is the early 90s and this uh sport of triathlon was coming on the scene and where I live in New Zealand there was these 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 you know, great personalities like uh, Aaron Baker, uh, mm. another woman, Aaron Christie, uh, and another one, uh, Rick Wells, and um, you know, just Legends. heroes to, to, yeah. to a young person. And then I ended yeah. up, you know, uh, going out training with Rick quite a lot, and you know, wow. learned a lot of these people, and you know, just got into the sport. Uh, and the thing is about endurance, especially longer endurance, as you know. Um, whilst you need to be sort of mentally tough, the pain's a lot softer than something like, uh, you know, rowing or, or, you know, imagine a 3000 meters running or, a, you know, four to 800 meters swimming. These are, these are sports where the piano actually does fall hard on you. Um, <laughs> and so, so that sort of softer pain of the, uh, the softer, endurance. Longer. It longer. There's um, other pains that come in there with the Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, but it's more of a, it's more of a thinking person's sport, right? Because you yeah. get to work through that. Whereas, you know, in a 400 meter swimming, no, you don't get to work through anything. It's, no. just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just falling on you. The sky's coming in. <laughs> and so I really love that stuff. And so I just did more and more of it. I just wanted to do nothing but that. You know, the mindset of the, the endurance athlete that, that just wants to do more and more yeah, of that. Yeah, but, more and more But, and more. Um, you know, luckily I sort of carried on with my studies and then um, started my academic career and then, and then, I became a psychologist. I'm actually quite used to psychology because <laughs> mainly because I want to give people the answer. And of course, you know, good psychological counseling is about asking open-ended questions. questions, you know, reflective listening um, and waiting for the 
client to come up with a solution, which is absolutely hopeless, um, as my wife would t t tell you. Um, yeah, that's You're more like action orientated, eh? Like, no, yeah. where's the solution here? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. This is why. This is the problem for you. Let's, let's sort that out. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you know, by the by the early two thousands, we'd we'd really just dawned on us that our kids didn't look like we did when we were kids. Yeah. And you know, like you go and look. I, I, I actually was reflecting on this the other day. I, I, I looked at my photo of Twizel Primary School, Year One, in 1974, and, and you know, by modern standards, that people would be wondering if those kids are properly fed, um, why the teachers are so lean, uh, and you compare that with with a modern day Year One primary yeah. school class or, or later, and it's a different world we lived in. That so that that was the early 2000s. That world had unfolded, right? So it didn't. Mm wasn't the same and and you know, kids went as fit as they used to be they were they went the same shape they used to be and and we wondered why and so that was really the field that welcomed me which was wow as that's who you uh, got tapped into nutrition. Yeah. yeah yeah I just didn't mean to and then you know all of a sudden I guess my research careers followed my curiosity around the world so you know when you're when you've got young kids, you're interested in young kids. When you've got teenagers, you're interested in young and teenagers. When I was racing elite high performance triathlons, you're interested in that. And and thankfully being an academic, it allows you the, especially in my field, allows you the freedom to roam around those uh, and and understand those different things. So I've sort of had a, maybe it's a short concentration span, but in fact, actually just a curiosity to keep rolling my research career and practice um, it, that's really my, gold that you can do that with an academic career, sort of go go like this and still stay, you know. Yeah, employed. I mean, you've got, you can't you can't go off into sort of you know rocket propulsion or something, but you know, like you, you know, as long as I'm sticking to the main things, which are being you know a, a, a sort of fitness, uh, nutrition, sleep, uh, well being, then you know those sort of four things combined mm. have really been my wheelhouse. But you know, in different the settings and the context seems to often change, and you know, then you you know like. A, you'll do some work and you'll discover what you think an answer is or not an answer is it's a dead end or it's actually got places to go then you're sort of done with that and you're on to the next sort of variation of something so yep. yeah, that's sort of been my um life so the latest stuff is really we've done you know a lot of work on on you know, low carb and keto diets mm -hmm. fasting written quite a few books on that yeah. and what the fashion yeah yeah and so that's been you know really interesting for me you know for, for reversing things like diabetes at one end of the spectrum um sort of that sort of metabolic dysregulation through to the other end of, of a of you know high performance ironman athletes who i coach still you know being able to triple their ability to burn free fatty acids at a given intensity and really you know have a pretty much inexhaustible fuel supply where before that they would you know really run out of glycogen and, and struggle through the enjoyment and performance of an event so so well, let's, that, um, let's 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 start with that one just if I yeah. may and, and interrupt you there because it's yeah. you know something that's fascinated me and you know when I was you know active career I'd never become fat adapted as an athlete yeah. what is so you, you your take is that sh should endurance athletes be always fat adapted or is it a genetic thing and some people are good at it and some people less so what is your take on it now like given the knowledge that you have and the experience so I think the, the normal human condition, if you wandered up to a Paleolithic human uh, before you know, we started farming grains and wheat and stuff, the sort of hunter-gatherers, that they would have uh, enjoyed this metabolic flexibility to use fat as a primary fuel source when they were resting and moving around at low intensities. And then um, as they got higher and higher intensity, then they would have supplemented that fat burning with the extra energy produced from burning glucose mm -hmm. in, in their body. and 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 but that doesn't exist so commonly. And so that would just be the normal human state that that's, you burn fat in some circumstances and carbs and fat in the other circumstance. But if you went down to the local Westfield shopping mall and you went to the food hall and you, you brought all those people up to my lab and put them on our metabolic cart and measured their, because you can measure breath, breath by breath gas analysis and mm -hmm. understand whether they're burning primarily fat or carbohydrate or whatever wow. mix of yeah and so we, we do that sort of graded exercise test you start at rest just breathing into the tube um the machine's analyzing fat and carb burning and as you increase you know intensity like running speed or power on the bike then then you just see this graded change now uh, your average person off the street in the food hall um doesn't burn fat even at rest so they're metabolically inflexible yep 
and then the question is can you train that um, and can you train that even in high performance athletes and, and I think the answer is yes and I'll give you a good example there's a, a young fellow I train um, Matt Kerr and Matt won't mind me saying this I've, I've trained him for a few years now so he, he came from a CrossFit background he was a fit young man um, you know he'd, he would be eating mostly carbs actually so mm -hmm. um, yeah that's and, what we were all told yeah, back in the day wasn't yeah it? yeah no totally yeah. so and and so he wanted me to help him prepare for an Ironman triathlon and so I started training him and say, I don't know, April one year. So over in New Zealand winter, didn't really mention diet because we couldn't seem to get to that, but we sort of got him on the idea that he had to go bike riding and what running would look like. And you know, he was learning these sports. Uh, and by December, he did his first triathlon, which was a 70.3, a sort of half Ironman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with a view to going through to Ironman New Zealand three months later in uh, beginning of March. And he did pretty well, actually. Like he came fourth overall wow. in the amateurs. So his first triathlon, yeah. he's a talented young man. He's, he's yeah. a swimmer. He could learn how to bike. He could run a bit. And I was like, but I knew he was a carb. And I was like, Matt, I need to put you in my lab and we need to measure your, you know, your fuel burning and that. So early December, we got him in there. And, and so his peak fat oxidation was about uh, half a gram a minute at uh, about 165 watts on the bike. So it's not very good power output. It's not going to be very fast. And um, he's only getting because uh, ha a gram of fat is about nine calories. He's burning mm -hmm. half of one of those a minute over 60 yep. minutes. He's, he's, you know, he's got about 400 to 500 calories an hour available from fat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's going to be racing at 1200 calories an hour. Yeah. So wow. um, over hard. several hours, yeah. he simply is going to run into all sorts of trouble, right? Because he's got this deficit of you know, 800 calories an hour he needs to find from glucose. And he's got probably 2,000 calories that he's got in his muscles and liver. Mm -hmm. And he can, consume another, he can consume another couple of hundred by, uh, by eating gels and stuff or bananas or something. Um, so he's woefully short. And, and so it means he can just make a half Ironman man over four hours. The point of eight or nine hours... He's going to he's going to grovel home. It's going to be a really bad mess. And indeed, that's what you see. It's always frustrated me. I go to things like Ironman triathlon. These sort of you know eight to uh, fifteen hour events or seventeen hour events for people. And uh, I think the saddest thing for me is first of all, there's you know two thirds of the field still mimics the general population, which is overweight. Yeah. Uh, and and virtually all of them run out of glucose or glycogen in their body sometime during the bike or shortly into the run. And so the whole marathon experience for them is a very unpleasant affair. Yeah. Um, they don't like doing it. They finally make it. It's been a real drain on, and they've had so much support from their friends and family over that preparation period. And it was all avoidable. So with Matt, with that in mind, we're like, well, this isn't going to happen with you, Matt. So um, we stuck him on a strict keto diet for three weeks. Um, his training over that period was was fairly low intensity. We didn't really go for any intensity up until after the new year mm -hmm. period. Um, and then just set him onto his Ironman training. And, and that includes um, his long run and his long bike, which he did weekly in a, as doing them fasted. Yep. So with just water. So people find that a little bit extreme, but the intensity is really low. Yep. Um, and so we'd go out and do, you know, like a six hour bike in the end at, you know, with no food, wow. Um, wow. and he'd be fine. And that's um, the thing, you're adapted. You get adapted. And so got him back into the lab just before Ironman, and he improved his maximum fat oxidation from uh, half a gram a minute at 165 watts or something to um, 1.1 grams a minute at um, 260 watts. Wow. So so now he's able to supply, you know, 800 calories an hour from, from, from fat. Set. Um, mm -hmm. And he can do it at 260 watts, which is actually a reasonably competitive power output. He's going to get along at, you know, 39, 40 k's an hour. Wow. And yeah, and so in his first, second ever triathlon, in his first Ironman, he does, you know, he finishes, I don't know, in the top uh, 10 in uh, nine hours, 22. So good effort. That's um, amazing. Yeah, we come back the next year, uh, now with a bit more training under his belt, and he, and he manages eight hours, 50. Wow. Um, and this year he comes back and he, he wins the entire age group race by, race by half an hour, breaks the course record by seven minutes and does 8.27. Wow. Um, and, and I got him back in the lab straight after that. And what we saw is, is further fat adaptation over that two-year period. So mm -hmm. now he is able to burn 1.8 grams a minute of fat 
at 310 watts. Ah, um, and that's an that's astonishing unusual. power output. So, so it's 310 watts. You know, you're doing 42 k's an hour on, on a decent course, and that's you know he 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 rode four hours 29 for 180 k's. It's you know it's a astonishing time, um, especially for a guy who's working full time as a teacher. Wow, so that's insane. So that's and, what we mean by being metabolically flexible and and becoming this, a real fat burning machine. But what about the arguments about you know? Um, I mean, keto diet is a very difficult diet for people to, you know, if we're talking about the general population now and, you know, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's quite a hard diet to stick yeah. to long term. Yeah. Yeah. What about, so adherence to things and then yeah. do you have to be strictly keto? Like yeah. you have to be really low on your carbs in order to get the ketones and the, you know, be in ketosis and to get this fat adaptation. Yeah. Is there any middle ground? Can you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great question. I mean, the, yeah, the, the, the series of questions you got there, Lisa, are just you know, crucial. And the answer is um, initially getting into that zone for that three weeks are very strict. Yeah. And so that that's three weeks. After that, um, it, you know, it's very much cyclical. So we generate nutritional ketosis and fat burning by fasted long workouts. Um, and on other key sessions during the week, we're adding adding carbohydrate quite a bit. So it's 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 definitely it's not a strict ketogenic diet at all. Um, and we'll have off periods where you know he's just eating whatever. Um, in fact, I actually have trouble trying to get him off the keto and to be a bit more loose, frankly. Yeah, um, he's very but, disciplined. Yeah, but that's that's right. an athlete, not a normal human. Yeah. Um, in that sense, so yeah, I, I mean, this is why I introduced the idea of fasting and intermittent fasting, and and I'm quite keen on that. Um, and, and you know, for me, in the what the fast book, I tried to sort of mimic what I felt was a an easy, sustainable, cyclical way for me to eat that generated yes fat burning. Yeah, and not and so. I and mean, you I, could is, do that with autophagy, you know, like um, you yeah, know, like well, we're well, all talking about intermittent fasting, and and yeah. I do it like an intermittent fasting, a shortish intermittent fasting. Yeah. It, it, you know, is that going to? This, I'm not going to get into ketosis doing an intermittent fast, am I? Like well, I'll tell you what we did. So, so I just I would do this sort of pattern of um, Sunday, try and be reasonably good on the low carb, just eat whatever I wanted, but you know, try and be okay with it. Um, Monday, do some restricted eating windows. So, you know, it might be. You know, a longish window. Um, someone who's experienced like me, I can just have one meal that day. And the Tuesday, I just did the same thing. So, you know, and and when that's I had a meal, nice. I would made sure it was super filling, super nutritious. I was calling them super meals. So that's my that's my Monday and Tuesday, my hard parts of the week. Right. So I worked hard and I concentrated hard on my nutrition, generated nutritional ketosis by by Monday lunchtime. Despite the weekend Saturday being quite poor I was back yeah. in full ketosis um, I made a bit of an effort on Monday Tuesday, so I sort of hung on to some stuff with you know no re particular restriction but trying to keep the carbs down for for Wednesday Thursday by the end of Friday everything had sort of gone pretty loose and Saturday was could be sometimes off the rails completely yeah and you know completely out of nutritional ketosis and plenty of carbs even the odd bit of alcohol which I'm not encouraging by the way but that just seems to happen sometimes yeah and you um you gotta live too yeah yeah so <laughs> so so I'd be completely out of ketosis and in no shape for that at all but by Monday morning I'll be back in again so I just get this period so you can do that like because that's that's been my yeah. question too it's like do I, do I if I go to keto you know go the keto diet um yeah. Do you, do, you, do you have to, you know, do it as a religion? You know, like this is like nah. this is me. And then you get people like Dave Asprey. I don't know if you read his book Fast yeah, yeah, This yeah. Way, and that yeah, yeah. Um, that was like you know he talks about cyclic keto and yeah. how that's even better than just being straight keto because you know keto itself can have some negative benefit. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. So completely agree. And so you know, unless you're wanting to be on keto for some sort of therapeutic reason and if had you know glioblastoma brain sort of you know, brain, brain cancer or brain injury like a tbi i think is a uh, interesting thing you know some uh, other cancers or you're in chemo therapy then you know, i don't see any reason to be in that state um all the time but the point is having the metabolic machinery to to be able to be and easily get in there now you know my hypothesis is that paleolithic one which is really that humans are metabolically flexible it's the normal human condition and to um, see modern humans that have really lost their orchestration of their metabolism to to burn fat as a primary fuel source is, is a sort of denying your own humanity type situation without being too dramatic about it really yeah. but yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And, but it, it isn't if we you know like um i was reading one of your blogs and you had um another uh, dr lisa timoringa i think it was yeah um saying oh 
but you know like if we look from an evolutionary perspective the cavemen because this is an argument that i've had with people too oh but the cavemen didn't live very long you know so therefore it's not a good diet and that's you know to to say that that's but that's not look but that helped us survive till now you know, yeah, like we complete, wouldn't. Have... That's a complete straw man of an argument, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, so too. F- 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 yeah, I mean, first of all, yeah, while the average life expectancy was fairly low for paleolithic this people, for that, other reasons. That's, that's for other reasons. <laughs> if you didn't have those reasons, you actually survival was pretty good. And and actually, you know, the important thing to remember is that paleolithic humans didn't have chronic disease, so they didn't have this these. You know, what they is didn't... it in New Zealand at the moment? Twelve years of disability in their life before they died which you know so subtract 12 off your lifespan to get your health span yes, you know, yes the health exactly. span and lifespan were the same thing and and, you know, and then we don't have infant mortality like they did and we didn't have lions right. chasing yeah. us and we've got all these other things that make us live longer yeah. but now we yeah. even have to take even more care of our metabolic to, you know our, our state in order that we don't have these long term and i mean i've been living with the consequences of mum's metabolic disorders leading to an aneurysm yeah. for the past five yeah. years and trying to undo yeah. the yeah. damage uh you know yeah. so I, I know what i'm talking about is like and that decline that we see with so many people for over decades sometimes and it's just a horrific way to go out for starters you know i, I don't think anyone if you ask them when they're in good health about how they want the rest of their life to track says they want to be in poor health with a low health span. I don't think that's a, a topic that people raise as being a good thing. No, and in fact, it's my experience not... when I ask even people who aren't doing many healthy behaviours of what they want, then they'll say health, family, friends, and happiness, whatever that means. But mm. the, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think this is the discussion that we need to be having so that we, we find out what the optimum diet is. And, and, and you know, like people are... I know I've, I've struggled with my diet over the years. You know, I, I, one of the reasons I started running was because I wanted to eat more because I love food, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> and then, then I've suddenly, you know, at some point I realized, hang on, this, this hypothesis of calories in calories out is absolute bullshit. Yeah. Um, but this isn't working. And, you know, that really came to, you know, people who heard my podcast and heard me say when I ran through New Zealand and I just suddenly woke up, you know, I was running 500 kilometers a week yeah. and I was wow. getting fatter because I was, I was in a complete state of chaos. You know, my hormones were up, my water retention, all of that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, high amount of inflammation probably. Huge amounts of inflammation. And yeah. I ended up flaccid, losing muscle mass and getting fatter and having a slower metabolic rate. I could have sat on the couch and eat chips and gotten better, you know, in better yeah, shape. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's when it sort of light bulb went for me like this. You know, and that it also had other reasons, like oh, genetically, I'm not really made for the long distance stuff. I'm more the uh, high intensity, sh- yeah, shorter, yeah. sharper is, is more yeah. suited to me. So I was doing that wrong as well, because some people it's better to be doing the long. But I think having these discussions where we really dig in and you've done the research, you know what, from an evolutionary perspective, what we need to be eating and the, the state of our food now is, the, is, the, is horrific. And then you you add into all that the the whole addictive nature of yeah. all the stuff and the additives, the preservatives, the MSGs, the all of the, the sugars that are added to our foods, and people are up against it. Like, you know, yeah, like yeah, it's not no, even I, I, I agree. Out. Actually, those two topics, it might be worth going into those. I've got two sort of yes, student please. theses and uh, you know, working in both of those areas. The first you mentioned uh, like you go out the state of our food supply. So what we've been doing recently is um, we've been going to primary schools around the place and we've been taking photos of all the year six's lunch boxes. Yep. And, and and whatever you think, particularly on you know what we call that social gradient, that sort of tipping of rich versus poor at the bottom end of that, whatever you think the food supply is like, I, I don't care what you think about how bad it is, it's worse than you think. Yeah. Um and, and you know, um I, I like I actually cried. I actually well, physically cried. This is what our kids are getting to eat every yeah, day. Yeah, and and so how that's not a priority um, yeah, is the thing. And it's, just, just remember that you know the biggest cost to our healthcare system for our kids is 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 having to anaesthetize them to extract teeth because they're rotten at age five and we can't they'll work around too much if they're not anaesthetized. So you know, I mean, what society treats is it's most vulnerable like that. You know, and 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 you know, just a, one little rant. In kids' healthcare, we have to, to go and do fundraising and buy raffle tickets to pay for our hospitals for kids, and we don't do that with adults. Um, you know, that sort of 
fundraising yeah. for that is despicable. It's not a government that cares. No. Um, so, not so to mention the whole bloody ambulance service and all that. Yeah, yeah, stuff. that's all anyway. that. So yeah, we don't fund that and all yeah, you know, all that <laughs> sort of stuff as well. So that's just a massive hole, yeah. frankly. That's a big hole. Um, yeah. And the second thing is, I've got another student who's just really got into this, the addiction side of food and. Mm. Yeah, as a form of psychologist, you go through and look at this, um, you know, you use this diagnostic and statistical manual, DSM, DSM-5 is the latest version, which is a way of characterizing disorders. And you look at this sort of substance misuse um, disorder, which is really around addictions. And, you know, if you change the word alcohol or methamphetamine or tobacco for sugar, yeah, then, you know, the sorts <laughs> of things, you know, um, you know, sometimes feel withdrawal, sometimes, you know, eat more than I should, change, change my behavior and uh, makes things worse in my life you know you go across all 11 criteria and you go yeah yep. it's, it's pretty plausible that's it's a real addiction. thing yeah and and the thing is with addictions of course is that people go because everyone's not addicted to it doesn't mean it's not a thing so there's there's, there's a lot of alcohol drunk where people don't turn into alcoholics yep um it doesn't mean there's not such a thing as alcoholics and it, there's you know and for many people it becomes a a, a substance they can't control using and, and, and i feel the yeah. same things yeah. about sugar and your know, ultra processed food in general really yeah and the sugar i mean the i mean that like the people like you i know you've done a lot of work with the pacific island population and maori and, and so on we have a predisposition to all to you know not being able to cope with the sugars and the more cardiovascular disease and more metabolic disorders um so we're even more prey to this stuff because the bodies yeah. aren't having had i don't know hundreds of years of, of having it to a certain yeah. degree um, and I mean, I've struggled, you know, sugar is definitely one of those things that is one of the hardest addictions, I think, not that I've been addicted to anything else, but it's a yeah. bloody hard addiction to, 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 to get rid of and stay on top of because yeah, and, it's, and, 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 quick, you know, like yeah, something like smoking or alcohol, like the abstinence part of it is, is you know, hard, but but, but it's slightly easier yeah. because it's contained, whereas sugar is so ubiquitous in the food supply. You can't it's, stop it's, it. It's very hard, you know. All of a sudden, you put some chili sauce on your something, and you know, oh, oh damn, yeah, it's seventy-five percent sugar. You know, like it's <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and you don't even realize it, and unless yeah. you start, you know, baking and making everything from scratch, and, yeah. and, you, and then you know, not to mention all the the MSGs and the additives, preservatives, yeah, yeah, emulsifiers yeah, yeah. that are you know destroying yeah. our guts and causing yeah. us to want more. I mean, there's a re reason why you can't eat one chip. If you eat one chip, you've eaten the packet. Because well, that's certainly my experience, but but um, strangely, and I had an argument with a dietitian the other day about this. There's this whole movement called intuitive eating, and it's like, oh, her hypothesis was, well, the whole reason we, um, I was like, look, there's no point having salt and chips in my house because they'll last five minutes. I'll eat the whole lot. Yeah. She's like, oh no, no, no. The way you should overcome that is just have. Um, have dozens of packets in there and just eat yourself silly and then you'll get over it. I no, was that's, like, no, 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 that's just bullshit in my experience. Pretty much done that and that didn't work. <laughs> Still want <laughs> some vinegar chips. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, that doesn't work. I've, I've heard that that theory too and I think that's yeah. absolute rubbish and not something that I'd recommend for a starters because no. you're going no, to actually I don't, I don't either. make so. yourself sick. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's like, you know, if a little bit's good, then we might as well just have some more. Um, yeah, no, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's ridiculous. Really? And they still, they still think that. Um, yeah, no, there's a whole movement. You're kidding. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> um, but how do we help people? Because people are unaware of the addictive nature of their food. And we're so, like, I, can't, I don't have a big garden full of organic veggies. I don't have the time, you know, all the, all the knowledge and the, you know, I used to have, a, my dad used to do my garden and then it was good, but now I don't. Yeah. Um, most of us don't have access to, to good quality foods. What the hell do we do? We go into the supermarket and it's just so easy to pick up a pre-made sauce, you know, a tomato yeah. sauce, a bolognese sauce, instead of, you know, buying a bloody lot of tomatoes and making it. But yeah, but we're, we're, we've fallen into this trap and now we're addicted, all of us, because the big food industry is wants you to eat more of its crap. Yeah, they've conspired um, yeah. both in research and... Um, practice and then just in all practical ways and in fact um, I wrote a paper with a, a couple of superstars actually a guy I see Mahotra who's a cardiologist and cardiologist in London and a Rob Lustig uh, who's pretty famous a pediatric mm. endocrinologist from San Francisco about mm -hmm. the, the the tricks that the 
food industries pulled, which are pretty much the exact same ones as Big Tobacco have over the years, you know, creating bogus interest groups, yeah, false advocacy, sponsoring yep. athletes, la, 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 um, list goes on. Um, and a part and of, of that machinery, unfortunately, you know, when I was a young athlete being sponsored by Coca-Cola, you know, like I never, yeah, right. didn't have a yeah, conscience well, I, 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 was told, I was told not to come back to Ironman New Zealand when I spoke there one time a couple of years ago because I, I, um, I, I had a go at their sponsor's product, which was Nutrigrain, Kellogg's Nutrigrain, which yeah, is yeah. You know, this four and a half star f- health rating food that's, you know, a third sugar. It's just a disgrace. Um, yeah, and that was not welcome again. We, so. You know, like yeah, when you see, you know, like famous sports teams, I won't name any, but, you know, and their nutritionists on the telly telling you to eat yeah. stuff that really is not what you want your kids eating. And yeah. you're just like, wow, that's, yeah. <clears throat> that is wrong on so many levels. Yeah. You know, actually, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, well, maybe I should tell this on it, but I, I, years ago, I was I gave this talk on sort of update on on you know physical activity and health for, for some executives at Coca Cola, um, over at this Waipuna Lodge in uh in Auckland. And and I'd finished my talk and I was just at the back and they hadn't quite realized they hadn't gone. And the next guy that got was a corporate guy from the US about how they're going to um discredit various nutrition people. And it's sort of active tactics. They went around and I sort of sat there and listened to it. And then I was like, wow. oh, and then after, about halfway through, I thought, shit, I, I'm actually, I might not get out of here alive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But there was like an active discussion about, about the tactics to, you know, to, to, to deal yeah. with scientists yeah. who were dissonant to the, to the view, um, wow. to, to their worldview, which I thought was a really interesting. That's, um, that's, point. but this is a reality. And this is yeah. what's happening, not only in the food industry, it's also yep. happening in the pharmaceutical industry. It's also yep. happening in, in many industries that we yep. in the public and not, you know, and we, we, you've got people like you that are brave enough to stand up and say stuff, you know, you get attacked. You know, I, I'm, I'm quite surprised that my podcast hasn't been taken off here yet. But anyway, yep. it's liable yep. to happen if Google hears yeah, it. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. And, and yeah, it will. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully it won't, but people, people will be there's forces in play there and you know you don't want to get too conspiratorial because it sometimes yeah. requires a degree of organization that doesn't they're not capable of but you know I, I think in the food industry case and pharmaceutical industry the evidence has been there for a long time yep yeah and and i think you know my approach to it now is like we are possible light a candle toward the good information rather than fighting and banging your head against the you know yeah. Because you know, otherwise you you can end up in a in a very bad place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but okay, so so we know that there's all these addictive forces, if you like, at, at play. And so, because you just look around town, you know, and and the obesity, and our boys are looking like girls, and you know, the hormone regulation is just obviously affected and um fertility rates are going down and you know we, we're we're fighting a war here and we've got kids that are getting already diabetic and before they're yeah. even teenagers and this is a coming huge disaster for the healthcare system um yeah yeah and i think and you're the, in public the, health the, the present one that i've become much more interested in because it's you know, I think it's become more obvious to me for a bunch of reasons. I'll tell you a few stories is, is, is mental health, particularly youth mental health. And so, you know, I've been an academic for, for a few decades. And, you know, a decade ago or two decades ago, okay, students would get sick and some would have some mild mental health problems, but it wasn't really a thing that you would see very much. Now, at the moment, I, I, all the time, I get you know, students so and so dropping out of the degree now because of their mental health, they've got an anxiety. And these are um, really smart, intelligent, switched on people with, you know, these are at the top of the socioeconomic ladder. And we know how much worse it is at the bottom. They don't even get there in the first place. Mm. Um, that, that youth suicide rate in New Zealand, it keeps getting talked about. It's the tip of an iceberg for a major problem. One of the women that I work with, uh, uh, mid 20s, beautiful, intelligent, woman you know we're talking about SSRIs, antidepressants she goes oh yeah i've been on those i could have knocked me over and i said oh you know is, is that a common thing for sort of your friend group and that sort of thing she goes oh yeah pretty much everyone i know is on them yeah 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 and yeah. and so we've got this it's a good segue into you know because the brain's a metabolic we've mm. got a metabolic crisis with obesity and diabetes but you know guess what the most important metabolic organ is it's your brain yeah and and somehow yeah, you know, again, you know, here we are asleep at the wheel. We've got this, you've got this treatment gap. So even if we could treat them with anything effective, which is doubtful, 
um, from our current system. Yeah, it can only treat half, half the half of the nine hundred and ten thousand people in a country of five million, because um, nine hundred ten thousand is the number with serious mental health problems. Wow. Um, half of them don't get any treatment wow. whatsoever because there is no treatment. Um, uh, you ring the mental health crisis line, which we've had to do, and they will say, "Are they killing themselves right now?" And that's just like no, and it's like okay, we'll go to your doctor then. We haven't got time. <laughs> yeah, and then okay, we're not doing anything, yep. and and we'll go to your doctor, and you go, what, what if you go to your doctor, you know that there's a nine month wait to see a psychologist. Yep. You know, like it's just unacceptable. And what's the um, answer? The the course, the easy answer for the doctor is to give them an SSRI or yeah, which an doesn't work very well. No. Um, impairs their neuroplasticity if they're a young person yep. and causes some harm. Um, and closes down hormones and you know does different yeah yeah hundred percent so 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 to me the you know the the unacknowledged metabolic crisis yeah we can see obesity um, yeah we can measure diabetes um, yeah and those are problems but you know to me the most perverse one especially having you know teenage kids myself and um, that sort of thing is this youth mental health thing it's it's you know, it's despicable um, and and you know like my, my dad. You know, good for him. He had metastatic prostate cancer and we sorted it with his keto diet. But the amount of access to expensive treatment he was able to get in his 80s compared to, you know, a, a young woman in the early 20s who has a serious mental health problem that's going to affect her and everyone around her for the rest of their lives who can get none. It's perverse. Like, who spends their money on health that way? You know, like, I want my dad to get his treatment and get better and everything, which he has. Mm. But, you know, like, what sort of society prioritizes that over, over these young people? Yeah, and what and what can we do? Like, why, you know, there there is a lot of. I mean, I I talk preach this a lot, and I know that your research is also pointing in this direction. That there's a lot of health fundamentals that we can get right that can actually help people without costing anything, even. Yeah. You know, without without having to be a pharmacological intervention. How about we we try to teach people how to manage themselves? And I, I mean, I've had. You know, I was on antidepressants for over 20 years and I could not get off them because yeah, they are addictive. addictive. And it Correct. took me three years to get off them. And thank wow. God I did. And, um, but I, you know, in my early 20s had, had you know, relationship crises, was put on them, you know, and just stayed on them because I didn't know any better. And wow. what, a, you know, what implications that's had for me and then trying to get off them. And of course, your body starts to downregulate your own you know, uh, yep. it's, you're not, you're not producing your own and I've got off them now and I'm fine and, and, and so on. And I'm helping other family members off them, but that was the first port of call. Now I understand the need for, you know, the, the health fundamentals like sleep hygiene and movement and exercise and sunshine and the right diet, because diet is a huge piece of the puzzle because your gut and your brain are connected. And there's a lot of, like you say, effects when you have a bad diet, you have, and you have bad nutrition, you're going to have more mental instability. If you, if you want to put it that way, you're going to have more problems than if you're on a good, really robust, solid, good diet. That's going to affect your mental health. And what are our kids, you know, they're not getting any of that information or any so, programs around that. Yeah. And you interfere with, you know, one aspect of metabolic homeostasis with an antidepressant. And you're surprised that it doesn't work very well, and there's unintended consequences. Mm, very um, big you know, ones. What what we're trying to do is, and humans, I think, all want to be in this state. We're trying to return ourselves to a sort of metabolic homeostasis where things are balanced and well regulated. And for you know, for the most of the body, that's the you know, primary target. There is the sugar in your blood and the insulin in your blood because if those aren't right then you're in an inflammatory environment and you know pro-growth and no chance to you know be in that autophagy of tightening things up so that's mm -hmm. the sort of you know big metabolic picture but in the brain you know, I've just started to stitch together a much more I, I think coherent view of what's going on because the the balance of of neurotransmitters in the brain is important uh, I just think like with the low fat revolution, we picked fat, not carbohydrates. We picked the wrong one of the three. Yep. Uh, with SSRIs, we picked serotonin yep. as, as the neurotransmitter, 
transmitter to manage and we need to get it back to where it started more yep. quickly. That's what reuptake inhibitors do. And um, actually, you, you, the, the, you, sorry. You, you've written a paper recently on um, um, glutamate and that's role in, in, in all of this. Can you well, I hadn't, I hadn't six is? months ago, I hadn't, I had heard of glutamate because I, you know, trained in psychology and frankly, I'd forgotten what it did uh, until one of my, you know, smart students reminded me um, that glutamate is the most important and most prevalent excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It, it's about 90% of your neurotransmitters. It, it runs in tandem with an inhibitory system called GABA. And mm -hmm. so these two things operate together. Uh, to, the inhibition fine tunes the excitation. Uh, and, and not only that, the glutamate gets recycled onto glutamine and then back into GABA and this, they, they rely on one another to be in a, in a sort of, uh, you know, good, and healthy cycle. relationship, right? Yep. And so what happens is when there's overexcitation, which, you know, chronic stress does, then glutamate, because it's excitatory neurotransmitter, just keeps getting pumped out. Yep pumped out pumped out and, and it hits its receptor at the other side of the the synapse you know between neurons um, and that 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 receptor it's called the nmda receptor gets mm -hmm. it's down regulated so it stops seeing the glutamate as much as it could be which causes wow. even more glutamate to be produced uh and and then this glutamate starts to seep out of that that cleft into just general space and the trouble with that it's toxic, and this is called glutamate excitotoxicity. So this mm. is not a theory, this is a thing. And, and it starts to kill brain cells. And the trouble with that death, first of all, it atrophies neurons, which is never good. No. Um, and they're not there anymore um, when they die. But those dying neurons themselves spill out glutamate into more glutamate into the wow. space. And you get this downward spiral of- the Neurodegeneration. Uh, and neurodegeneration, exactly right. And so, the, the the most interesting thing in my mind about this and this is why I'm so excited about it mm. is is because and, and you'll see this so the most obvious is a concussion or a mild TBI a, a traumatic brain injury is that um, what causes your initial brain cell death is just an insult like you bang your head right mm. so you get that gluto glutamatic cytotoxicity and the, the initial effect of the concussion is mild but the long-term effects of the concussion because of the glutamatic cytotoxicity are severe. And so, so you know, that's why concussions get worse and worse and worse for, for a time after they've happened. Oh, God, uh, thanks for and, somebody saying that because people go to the hospitals with a concussion and they go, no, there's, you've had a mild concussion, go home and rest. And that's it. And it's like, well, there is so much we can do. And there's there's, there's 100% there's so much we can do. And in fact, we already do it when it gets really severe, right? So... So um, if you're in hospital with ischemia, you know, so lack of oxygen in the brain from a heart attack, or sometimes in some hospitals, a neonatal hypoxia, so you've become, newborns become part of oxygen. Um, one way that they deal with that is that they, they induce hypothermia because cold exposure, um, especially in those areas, helps reduce glutamate. Um, and they provide intravenous magnesium because magnesium um, antagonizes as a receptor and allows glutamate to get back to its homeostatic levels more quickly and it's highly effective and the animal studies are very very convincing and it's now in clinical practice even for things like spinal cord injury and then you start oh. to think about other ways that the brain gets damaged so Alzheimer's and dementia is an interesting one so for other reasons um, including high glucose we start to lose uh, brain cells but as, uh, but as soon as you start to develop that excitotoxicity then then it exacerbates the problem massively uh, a, a mild you know, a severe stress which results in post-traumatic stress disorder is another way of damaging the brain initially through chronic yeah elevated gluto glutamate but it, yeah. but it, it rolls onto itself yeah. and unless it's solved then it, then it's not a problem and this it, is why stress problem. and trauma can yeah, have but, but just chronic, chronic stress, you know, yeah. you're just stressed out, your fight or flight response is up more than it should, and it goes on a long time. The two to three minutes that it's designed to be up for is actually days, months, years, mm -hmm. same thing. Uh, and so you've got these different brain pathways. Brain damage happening. You're getting wow. brain damage. And you take, you, you, if, you, if you scan people with major depressive disorder, or you autopsy um, people who have committed suicide, then you see severe atrophy in things like the hippocampus and prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex, mm -hmm. important That's areas, right. mm. um, and it's caused by glutamatic cytotoxicity. And so, so, but the reason all that's interesting is that there's a lot you can do about it. And so we mentioned cold, 
Yep. So cold water therapy, just you know, getting in cold water, especially if you can breathe slowly and deeply through your nose, which down regulates the nervous system, yep. is a, is a, is a, is a clinical therapy for depression, therapy. right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, and, and potentially, I think, for TBI wow. and concussion and uh, Alzheimer's and that sort of thing, because it, it helps with that. Mm -hmm. um, but so is aerobic exercise for the mm -hmm. same reason. Uh, so, so is a whole range of nutrient supplements, particularly magnesium. Um, particularly, you have to take that in the form of magnesium citrate or magnesium oh. L3 and 8. Um, and, and the clinical trials of magnesium citrate and depression, it's a more effective medication than an antidepressant. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's no real side effects. So magnesium, zinc, uh, omega-3 fish oils, um, B-complex vitamins, uh, vitamin C, vitamin D, are all, you know, uh, anti-inflammatory, yep. antioxidant type uh, and all stuff that I'm on every day, my mum's on with her brain injury on all the time. That's right, know. because and, and they are they are down regulating glutamate transmission uh, yeah. and um, achieving a glutamate GABA balance in a better way. Um, as does uh, presence of ketones in your blood occasionally. Yes. Uh, as does any sort of diet that's anti-inflammatory, and any diet that's inflammatory exacerbates the problem. So, so, so for things like brain injuries, like, you know, someone like mum who was in a coma and they were putting a, a ba basically a glucose drip into their, you know, into feeding tubes. Yeah. And that's just like, that's just like c causing m more damage than if we'd had ketones present, you know, if we'd had a yeah, high fat. Yeah, 100%. Because you, you, there's, there's also a fuel, an accompanying fuel crisis in the yeah, brain where you can't uptake, can't, the can't, can't uptake the glucose in the mm. normal fashion, but you can use ketones. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got the glutamate part going on and you've got the glucose fuel crisis. So, you know. And isn't that, that the same with Alzheimer's and, and um, you know, they, it's, it's uh, you know, when you get insulin, insulin, uh, insulin resistance, resistance yeah. and then you, you also get, uh, the glucose not being able to be uptaken in the brain, and therefore the brain starving for glucose. Yeah, and you, so, you so a, a ketogenic times. diet for that yeah. group is actually a pretty therapeutic diet, and that would be the one situation I would be, you know, agreeing full that a, you know, more, full keto is hard. I mean, obviously it's a hard population group to work with, and yeah. get them on that, but you know, that's, that's it doesn't yeah, make that's, it not therapeutic. That's another whole. No, and that's what I put. System. You know, like with mum's brain injury, once I sort of started to realise that from the research I was doing, I had her as on as good as possible keto diet for that first couple of years not so much now because she's yep. got she's got um autonomy yep, <laughs> so yep. it's a little bit harder <laughs> to regulate yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she does do intermittent fasting and she has got all the supplements and she has got a very you know low carb diet um yep. as, as much as i can get her to do it when she's not sneaking things around the back um but th this is just so crucial for all of these degenerative diseases you know and uh, I'm really excited um, ab about this this glutamate thing because it's only just come on my radar, you know, yeah. through your research. And 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 I think that this is uh, perhaps going to you know go to the next level. Are you continuing the research on this? Yeah, yeah. Because and and I'm really interested in you know I haven't been that interested in micronutrients um, through my career. I sort of felt while well, you're eating whole food, you know, that should be the template. And I still think that, but I. I've increasingly started to think, um, especially my colleague, Julia Rucklidge, who's a, a professor of psychology at University of Canterbury and her work with micronutrients. Mm -hmm. um, she uses fairly high doses, but the, how effective those have been in her clinical trials with um, various aspects of mental health. Um, and, and, you know, just actually also random other outcomes, like they, they just happened to be doing a clinical trial when the Christchurch earthquake happened mm -hmm. and they're only halfway through it. So the randomization wasn't quite complete and they, they noticed at the end of the trial that the um, people in the micronutrient supplementation group, um, they about 19% of those ended up with some sort of post-traumatic stress from the, the, the Christchurch earthquake. Yep. Whereas those without, who were in the placebo group, 69% had post-traumatic stress. And this is consistent with other research around you know, the stress of natural, disaster, natural disasters and that sort of thing. Um, and all sorts of other things go wrong with the brain. And it's just like, you know, there's a massive effects, you know, if you could get this from a pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical company would be all over it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're talking about inexpensive <laughs> micronutrients. So, yeah, so we're, we're, yeah, yeah, we're interested in those really. So, really so that improves your resilience, basically. I and mean, you've got the, the, the right, you know, the right vitamins and minerals and things in your body to do the work that's needed to be re required. Um, have yep. you have you heard about the research of ketamine and um, uh, post traumatic stress? Um, so that when that ketamine is able to um, stop the formation of the uh, the memories, uh, that you know the traumatic 
traumaticness, if that's a word. Um, yeah, so, the, so the, yes, yeah, yeah, because yeah. that's part of that. That'd be part of that glutamate thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, so I'm ketamine is ketamine's a, a um, antagonizes the NDMA receptor, which yes. we, is, is the same uh, mechanism that magnesium rolls a play, plays a role in. And so um, ketamine is a little bit more of a difficult substance to think about it because yeah, it's an analgesic yeah. and it's, it's sort of that pre-anesthetic anesthetic and it really spaces people out. Um, but but you're right across um, PTSD, you know, single treatments have been shown to be highly effective. Single mm -hmm. treatments with major depressive water otherwise intractable have shown to be you know, temporarily effective. The most interesting one for me, you know, I was just talking to a, a, an ethicist the other day about this. He was talking about ketamine with um, with you know, chronic pain sufferers and about mm -hmm. half of the people they treat with ketamine with chronic pain, they have an instant and complete alleviation of the chronic pain. And wow. they give them ketamine at a subclinical dose for five straight days. Uh, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of that. Does exactly. that stop think, the pathways from, I don't know what, I think it, it, it re, re, it antagonizes it. the receptor is the, the uh, and that uh, glutamate pathway for a start, which is the only real known mechanism uh, amongst a possible other things. But, you know, again, it's an astonishing in effect, right? So this is otherwise incurable, life debilitating chronic pain. Five days of treatment of the subclinical dose, you're not, you're not unconscious wow. or anything, you probably can't drive around, but, um, and, and it's cured, gone, not Gee, there. Huge so, potential. yeah, so, so oh. ketamine is an interesting one. Uh, and equally, there's other interesting antagonists of that receptor, which uh, I'm obviously no expert in, but other people are starting to do the work in. And unfortunately, they become illegal drugs like um, some of those hallucinogens, like psilocybin, yeah. the magic mushrooms, and the you know these ayahuasca ceremony type things in South America. You know, um, the, I hope these... they do keep researching those. Just because they're drugs doesn't mean that they're um, they haven't got therapeutic benefits. I think. No, so they have potential therapeutic benefits, yeah. and you know, to understand that, I think it's going to be that's. Uh, we'll follow that. I won't be doing any of that research, of course, but so someone will be, and then it'll be interesting to follow that as that unfolds. Um, so and and we... you can understand, just to finish that, with uh, in the US in the 60s, all that came out, LSD, no one knew what to do with these drugs. So they just made them illegal, which is, you know, you can understand it at the time, but probably needs to make a, another think about that. Yeah, they do, they do. So when, when you, so all of these things, from things like Alzheimer's to to brain injuries to, to stress, chronic stress, to uh, big stressful life events, all cause an excess of glutamate. Is that correct? Like, yeah, because, right because it's, just, it's just it's just over excitation because because it's the it's the excitatory system and you're overproducing and you, and you haven't got a pathway. So you have to... sympathetic. You're in a sympathetic state. You're in a fight or flight response. Yes, correct. And that, state. that'll get that'll get there. And some of those are uh, just because there's. Well, no, the traumatic brain injury and the Alzheimer's aren't because of that. There's other reasons that their brain cells yeah, are well, dying. That, close, that yeah. causes a glutamate yeah. thing. But, but for the PTSD, for the depression, for the you know chronic Long stress term. sufferer. And this is yeah, why that, stress, that's... one of the reasons why stress is just so damaging to us, isn't it? And yeah, we weren't designed. To... We weren't designed for long-term stress. We are designed for acute fight or flight. Yeah. Yeah. And then being able, so this is why I think the, 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 the research and information around how to turn on your parasympathetic nervous system at will, you know, breath work, uh, cold therapies, yeah. uh, all of, you know, saunas, you know, heat therapies, all yeah. of these things that we can do to, to manage our stress levels, because, you know, stress is probably not going to go away anytime soon. You know, we've got these, you know, incredibly stressful lives that we lead mm -hmm. now um, with, you know, thousands of jobs that we have to do and, and yeah. things and you know things like you know like when my, my dad passed away eight months ago that was a you know a stressor i couldn't control yeah, it's, it's it's life isn't it's it life, life and, and death yeah. is, is stress is involved and that's left a you know a massive uh, post-traumatic stress that so i'm interested in all this research on how do i undo that damage if you like um, how yeah, do I, I how do I yeah, manage it? Yeah, and, yeah. and it's, this sort of stuff is really interesting. I, I just think you know the the mainstream medicinal effects of you know, cold therapy, hot therapy, and and uh, breath work, especially nasal breathing, mm. um, you know, are now sufficiently well established to to be mainstream. These are normal things mm. to engage in in your daily life to yep. manage your life. They, um, they, you know, they, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think nasal breathing, the, the work, I don't know if you know Patrick McEwen and yeah. uh, James yeah. Nestor and stuff, that's yeah. just absolutely amazing work that uh, and information that we can put into our daily lives to help cope it, to help us cope with this stress that we're under and the, and the bad food even, you know, it can all yeah. help, you know, and well, athletic I, I, performance. I, I, and you know? I love about those guys, um, 
with that stuff that they've actually they haven't tried to dumb down the science from the lay for the lay public. They treat them with the respect that they deserve, and they just translate it into an understandable manner. But they don't dumb it down. Like they oh, give you the full noise. I and love I, it. I, I, I love that. I just yeah. think, you know, like it's like I eat three plus servings of vegetables yeah. and two of fruit and exercise half an hour a day and not too much gardening yeah. or do it it's like you know it's just bullshit it's just treating us with disdain yes. and, and not with the deserve respect yes uh, and respect that we deserve for, for for you know where the science is at like no actually get fitter the more the better um yeah. as long as you manage it you know like it's pretty friggin you know like why 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 do they not you know and i see cancer uh patients getting told oh, i just want to eat whatever makes you feel good I know. it's like, like, like no no. Like I want the best possible information. Yes. Thank you. Yes, um, and not eating cookies while you're having chemo. Um, yeah. You know, and that's what they're doing. And it's just like, do you not, are you not aware? Have you looked at the, the metabolic, you know, approach to well, cancer? Well, often the excuse, not... I, the excuse though, Lisa, is, oh, well, um, they won't do it, so there's no point telling them. And, uh, um, that, that, that's, that's just not good enough, right? No, no. That, and yeah. that is just treating you. That's how, you know, and I've, you know, I've experienced this, unfortunately, firsthand, treating you like an idiot because you're not a professor. Yeah. You know, like just because I don't have a professor in front of my name does not mean I'm an idiot. And don't treat yeah. me like an idiot as if I don't know anything. And that is, unfortunately, the way you get treated in the system. Yeah, pretty, yeah the health system's much. not good for that. And they try and use jargon to bamboozle, you know? Yeah. Um, doesn't work with me but it, yeah. you know like it, it, that and that's not fair yeah correct. and you know when i'm teaching people or, or or working with people i i find it's absolutely crucial that i explain the mechanisms of action behind why i'm giving you this information and i yeah. try to keep it to a, a, a level that i don't overwhelm people but i want them to understand why they're doing this in order to make because then they're more likely to go oh actually i get it now you know yeah. just telling you that stress is bad for you you should yeah. uh, meditate for a day but i don't tell you why and what are the yeah. mechanisms and what is this actually doing in your body then you're less likely to do it you know so i mean I just for that i just, just today and you know actually the reason i'm late with you is that i had a group of uh, first year electrical apprentices such so young guys from sort of 17 to 20 yeah, in here at, at um, mm -hmm. university and, and we awesome. did a day's stuff. We did some fitness stuff with them, but I did a bunch of content. Uh, you know, frankly, I can get them up to master's level. These are smart guys. You wow. explain it probably they're interested in it. It's yeah. great. Um, you know, and no one's treated them like that and they never had got treated like that by some of their teachers obviously at school. They didn't get interested in those areas, but you know, like, like. Yeah, let's treat people as if they have got a brain in the head just because yeah. they don't know the jargon. Yeah. You can explain the jargon, and when you when you understand, one of my um, great uh, podcast loves at the moment is uh, Professor Andrew Huberman. Do you know him from the yeah yeah I've, I've been lab? following that. He's done a great job of just sort of sitting on the couch and having yeah. a you know sign, no no graphs no pictures, just a you know it's you know, deep scientific lectures about cortisol and you know stress axes and yeah, and it's everything. really yeah. even if you're not yeah. you know that you haven't yeah. spent a decade studying this stuff you can you can understand him he makes yeah, it very yeah yeah i mean who knew that, you know, it down. yeah you know, high grade neuroscience and medicine yeah you know, just available to the public they love no it. it's awesome yeah. that's why you've got to get your podcast back up <laughs> yeah yeah i've got to get it going you, you could remind us to get on your one and get me reinvigorated <laughs> exactly because we need we need to we need it straight from the horse's mouth so to speak we yeah. need it from people who are at the cutting edge of academia of academia the yep. cutting edge of research to deliver it a straight rather than it going through the zigzag of 10, you know, professionals along the way, getting dumbed down to the point where it's of no use to anybody. Yeah. And then it goes into the ministry of health and comes out in another formal look yeah, as well, yeah. which is, you know, like just complete bullshit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if, if you just look at the whole, you know, vitamin C recommendations, you know, like they've been trying for years, the scientists to get it, you know, the, the recommended daily allowance, or, uh, you know, recommended daily amount that you meant to have put up just a little bit. Yeah. But you no, know, we can't do that. You know, no, even I mean, though yeah. the science says that that's not enough, well, I mean, the, the, the entirety of the nutrition dietary guidelines are, are a joke. Know, complete, complete joke as far, so far as I'm concerned. But mm. um, yeah.
<laughs> Professor Grant Schofield, you've been amazing today. I've really loved this conversation. I've, I've taken up a heap, heap of your time. I would love to have you on, uh, obviously, for more sessions if, if we can, um, because yeah, I think you know, we haven't even touched the sides, really. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's a heck of a lot. Are there any last things that you want to share? What what are you your, a couple of takeaways from today and our conversation today that you really want to uh, spotlight and make people. Oh, make I, sure think, I still think that, away. you know, your body wants to be in a state of, you know, the scientific word is homeostasis, but in a state of balance, I guess, with the world it lives in. Um, but the world it's designed to live in um, needs to somehow match or be at least somehow close to our current world. And often those are a long way apart. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the major issue isn't it is that we, we we can't reach this homeostasis so we end up with either our glucose or insulin being really high as the sort of global things or this whole glutamate thing running amok and you know it's entirely predictable then on that basis that we're actually not going to be as well um functioning as we would like and yeah. so then the question is what can you do about it um the thing is we always put it back on us which is good what doesn't need to start with us but i think we forget we live in you know, most people listen to this live in a democracy. Um, mm -hmm. And part of a democracy is everyone actually has a say. Um, so, you know, my sort of hope is that, you know, everyone, you guys out there um, become a little bit more vocal about that. I think that's a really important thing. Like, like there is a democracy around health, there's a democracy around wellbeing. We get to decide, like the country decides. Um, and actually we do eventually overwhelm the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry and all that sort of stuff. It becomes that important. It's become pretty obvious that, um, especially if you're young people, we can do so much better and we, we just need to. Yeah. Um, and so that's up to everyone, not just me. Like, yep. I'll, I'll keep trying guys. But... <laughs> yes, please <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah. You, because at least you have the, the titles, the credibility, the name, the books, the stuff behind yeah. you to actually make a massive impact. But if we yeah. collectively all put our two cents in, so to speak, yeah, there's miles more than I can do. Um, and, and just on that, um, we've we've been, you know, I've written the books. That's great. Have a look at those. I've yeah, we've, list we've, out your books and, and where where can people find you? Oh, uh, so there's there's there's, and there's all that. yeah, there's what the fat um, book dot com, and that's got the what the fat, the what the fast, mm -hmm. the what the face is our latest one. There's what the fat recipes. There's what the fat sport performance. I'm you know really incredibly proud of the me and the rest of the team that's not a solo effort that's put those together especially Karen Zinn and Craig Roger mm -hmm. um, we've started a, a company called Precure it's been going a few years now and we've really concentrated on um, filling a sort of treatment gap in health and the health sector with health coaching yep uh, and, and sort so of advanced good. health coaching and nutrition and, and you know, mental health aspects as well um, like in my opinion if you're passionate about health um then you don't need to go to university for 10 years to make a difference. Um, there's some stuff you need to learn, especially around the coaching aspects around how to um, help people find the most for themselves, meeting where they're at and those things. And those are good fun skills to learn both for yourself and your family, but also for helping other people. So yep. Precure we sort of felt, uh, so it's uh, prevention is cure, Precure P, Pre with a K, Precure. Precure, P-R-E-K-U-R-E. -E. Yeah, dot com. And um, we've, we've, we're really passionate about helping you help yourself with your health, but more than that, helping help others. And that's the sort of help, help you know, taking a part of the, uh, taking an active part in this um, issue um, yep. for us is, is around, you know, take advantage of democracy, but also take the advantage to help, you know, when you get new knowledge and it's useful, you know, share it for God's sure. sake. Yep. Um, that's, that's, that's going to chip away at, yep. you know, the food industry and the sort of other forces that, tend to undermine any attempt at you know human well-being change and yeah. yeah and i think this you know the health i mean i'm obviously here in the health coaching space yeah. and yeah. and this is a new burgeoning area we need more people coming into this area that yeah. you know um can share this sort of knowledge and bring it out there and you you know and who better to keep you on track and helping you with things between friends and family and and other people you know around your community rather than having to go to the clinic and the doctor and you know it's all sickness orientated but and you've you got know, 15 uh, minutes if you're lucky yeah but someone who's actually got a genuine interest in how you're going and mm -hmm. wants to help you mm -hmm. uh and you know so i think we'll go that way i'm really looking forward to that
Yeah, let's keep working on this mission. <laughs> I think we're on the same mission. Uh, Professor Grant, you're just awesome. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed our conversation today and we'll hopefully have you on again soon.